We all know that Detroit, Michigan is widely known as being the capital of automaking. Yet probably most people do not realize the role that Northeast Ohio played in this very prominent industry. At one time Cleveland was the hub of auto manufacturing, and Akron was considered the Silicon Valley of its day. In this episode of the Icons of Northeast Ohio, we will examine the way the area affected the creation of one of the most important and most lucrative manufacturing industries of the world. Before we begin, if you like this video, please subscribe to our channel and click on the notification button, so you can be notified when we drop new videos, like this one. First, a brief history of the automobile. As far back as 1769, Nicolas Joseph Cugno of France built the first self-propelled vehicle. He created this state-of-the-art vehicle for the military. Soon after, Karl Benz of Germany got the patent for the first gasoline-powered vehicle that was powered by an internal combustion engine. He received the patent in 1885. In the United States, the first gas-powered automobile was built by Charles Durier and his brother Frank. They built and tested their automobile in 1893, on the Howard Bemis Farm in Chicopee, Massachusetts. They used a horse-drawn buggy as the body of the auto, and placed a four-horse-powered single-cylinder engine, onto that buggy. This early automobile also included a friction transmission, spray carburetor and low-tension ignition. They tested the automobile a few more times, and then put it away in storage, where it remained until 1920. It was eventually donated to the United States National Museum. By 1895, there were enough cars made in Europe that they held the first automobile race in France, called the Paris-Bordeaux Automobile Race. It was a 727-mile course. And only nine of the 22 vehicles that entered the race, actually finished it. But the world got word of this race, and it sparked intense interest in this new technology, especially in the United States. American inventors realized the automobile was no longer just an odd entity, but something that was finally coming of age, and was ripe for the new century. Now, the best equipped manufacturers to leap headlong into this brand new technology, were the ones who were set up already to make carriages or bicycles, and Cleveland, Ohio had an abundance of these types of manufacturers. The first person to dive into making an automobile in Cleveland, was Alexander Winton. Winton was a Scottish immigrant who arrived in Cleveland in 1884. He started out as a metal worker. Then, he employed his talents into making bicycles, and a few years after he settled in Cleveland, he opened up the Winton Bicycle Company. The standard bicycle of the time, had several elements that were very adaptable to the new automobile technology. This included the chain and sprocket drive, the wire spoke wheels, the tubular steel frames, rear view mirrors and the use of rubber tires. Winton studied how the Europeans built their combustion engines, and by doing so, figured out how they worked. He then tinkered around with his bicycles, incorporating everything he learned, and created his first automobile, which he had announced in the Horseless Age magazine in November 1896. One year later he created the Winton Motor Carriage Company. His first automobile had a two-cylinder, two-horse-powered engine. Winton then showed off his new automobile, by driving it from Cleveland, west to O'Leary, Ohio, and back again. It went at a speed of 12 miles per hour, which for the time, was fast. The next year, Winton began producing a standard model automobile. He anticipated demand for the car. This was a new concept, as all the auto manufacturers at that point, had only made their autos, one at a time, and not in bulk, as Winton chose to do. And by all accounts, his gamble paid off. He sold his first standard automobile in March 1898, and sales were steady from then on. Because of the way Winton chose to sell his vehicles, it began the automobile industry, as a whole. Winton's standard automobile, ended the period of autos being a novelty item, 
that up to that point, were made exclusively for the very wealthy. They were now, part of the technological mainstream, of the day. And Winton was also a genius, when it came to publicity. He knew that showing off his auto in various ways, would bring more interest in his car, and, in autos in general. In 1897, he raced one of his cars, getting up to a speed of 33.5 miles per hour, which was incredibly fast for the time. Then in 1899, he made the first long road trip, going from Cleveland to New York City. He took with him a Cleveland Plain Dealer reporter, by the name of Charles Shank. Shank wrote exciting tales of their time on the road. When they finally reached New York City, they were welcomed by a large crowd of cheering fans. Over a million people saw Winton and Shank in their car, on this famous road trip. Winton took another long road trip in 1903, this time he went from San Francisco to New York City. That trip took 64 days, and established both endurance and distance records. He was also a technological pioneer, creating some of the first commercial vehicles, including the first eight-panel truck in 1898. The truck was so successful, that he created a commercial section at his Cleveland factory, in 1900. Winton was the first manufacturer to use a steering wheel, while the rest of the auto manufacturers were still using the tiller. He introduced the multiple disc clutch, the eight-cylinder motor, and also created a self-starter, which used compressed air. Winton later turned his talents and ingenuity from automaking, to making diesel engines for ships. But he forever remains one of the first real pioneers of the auto industry, and helped to make Cleveland the hub of automaking at that period of time. Another manufacturer from Cleveland that turned his original manufacturing company into an automobile company, was Walter Baker. Baker had founded the American Ball Bearing Company in 1895. He sold his products to bicycle and carriage manufacturers. In 1898, Baker decided to enter the automobile market, and organized the Baker Motor Vehicle Company. He exhibited his first electric car in 1900. The car used 10 batteries, but only had a 3 4th horsepower motor. The batteries also needed to be recharged after 20 minutes of driving. It was initially, not the most practical vehicle on the market. Baker worked on his auto, and was soon able to install a more powerful motor, with longer-lasting batteries. But the Baker vehicle still remained a very slow car, with limited cruising range. Still, it was a fairly quiet car, and it did not require shifting gears, which with other cars, could be very difficult. Because of these features, it became the most popular vehicle for women, and was marketed mainly to them. But electric vehicles were not as popular as gasoline-powered automobiles. Because of this, Baker could not compete with other auto manufacturers, so he decided to merge his company with Roch and Lang. He stopped producing automobiles for individuals, and focused on making his electric vehicles for industrial purposes only. Also, during this period of time, another type of automobile that was popular, was the steam-powered auto. The White Company of Cleveland, was one of the largest manufacturers of these type of cars. Since 1866, the White Sewing Machine Company, was a major manufacturer in the city of Cleveland. Thomas White came from New England to Cleveland, bringing with him, his knowledge of the sewing machine industry. The White Sewing Machine Company not only made sewing machines, but they also manufactured roller skates, kerosene lamps, machine tools, phonographs and bicycles. When the auto industry began rolling along in Cleveland, White started out making auto parts, adding them to the vast amount of other items they produced at the time. White's son Roland, went to Cornell University. While studying there, he began to be interested in the auto industry. Roland's interest flourished even further, when after leaving Cornell, he went to work at the Baker Motor Company. He also traveled to Europe, 
to study how they made vehicles. It was there that he became a convert of the steam vehicle. After returning home, he got working on a flash steam boiler that he patented in 1900. This boiler allowed the vehicle operator to raise enough steam to start a car quickly. Roland displayed four steam cars in 1900, and the next year they produced 193 cars for sale. Roland White's steam car quickly gained a reputation for both quality and dependability. By 1906, the White Steam Car Company reached an annual production of 1,500 cars. They claimed that this number was twice what any other auto manufacturer, anywhere in the world, was selling. That year they built their new factory, which stood at East 79th Street in St. Clair, in the heart of the city of Cleveland. White, along with the Stanley Car Company, are considered the two most important steam engine automakers in the U.S. White continued to make autos and eventually moved into heavy truck manufacturing. The White Company remained a major part of the auto industry well into the 1920s. By 1909, automobile manufacturing became the third largest industry in Northeast Ohio. There were 32 auto factories in the area, employing over 7,000 workers and providing nearly $21 million worth of automobiles. Just some of the other auto manufacturers in the area included the Chandler, the Jordan, Peerless, Stearns Knight, Owen Magnetic, Templar and Packard, which had its factory in Warren, Ohio, just east of Cleveland. Another automaking pioneer from Northeast Ohio was Eli Olds, who was born in Geneva, Ohio. Olds learned his craft in Cleveland and then took his talents to Detroit to help build the auto industry over there. In the early days of the 20th century, over 80 different makes of autos were manufactured in Cleveland and in Northeast Ohio. This continued until the last car that was originally manufactured in Cleveland, the 1931 Peerless, rolled out of the factory for the final time. After that, Detroit became the main hub for auto manufacturing until the late 20th century. Even as Cleveland auto manufacturers stopped building their once popular cars, Cleveland remained the second largest center of the automobile industry in the U.S., mainly because of the rise of parts manufacturing. Charles Thompson began making valves for white car engines in 1904, and later his automotive company became Thompson Products, which in 1924 became part of TRW. Eaton Corp. became a major producer of gearing for commercial vehicles. A group of Case Western Reserve University School of Applied Sciences graduates founded Lubazol Corporation in 1928, where they manufactured a motor oil additive. 70% of the steel made in Cleveland was destined for the automobile industry. But there was another part of Northeast Ohio that became a very important part of the auto industry and was considered the Silicon Valley of its day. And that was Akron, Ohio. It all started with Dr. Benjamin Franklin Goodrich. Dr. Goodrich came from upstate New York. He went to Case Western Reserve University to study at its medical school. After leaving college, he returned home but struggled at his medical practice. He went to work in the Pennsylvania oil fields, where he then became a real estate speculator. In 1869, in partnership with J.P. Morgan, Goodrich purchased the Hudson River Rubber Company. He first located the company in Melrose, New York, but soon realized there was no advantage to having a rubber company in the Allegheny region of New York. He decided to return to Cleveland, presenting his company to various industrialists, hoping to get funding to set up a factory in the city. Only none were interested. Soon after being rejected from the Cleveland industrialists, he was handed a flyer from the recently formed Akron Board of Trade. Dr. Goodrich saw what Akron had to offer, and this included labor, cheap abundant water which was vital for the rubber industry, the Ohio and Erie Canal and the influx of railroads. The Akron Board of Trade was very open to having Dr. Goodrich set up his rubber company in their city, 
giving him the financing he needed to make the move to the city. Goodrich started out making rubber hoses, bicycle tires, and a variety of other rubber items at his Akron factory. When the auto industry became more popular, he then started making tires for the cars being built in Northeast Ohio. And Goodrich's success began the development of a new industry in the city of Akron. The next to look to Akron and the rubber industry as a good manufacturing opportunity was the Cyberling brothers. Frank Cyberling started his career working at his father's company, the J.F. Cyberling Company. They made reaping machines for farmers. Frank Cyberling invented a twine binder machine that tied grain bundles in a bow knot. But his father's company failed in the Panic of 1890. By 1898, Cyberling was jobless, almost 40, and he had a large family to take care of. He learned that there was a strawboard factory that was for sale in East Akron. So, he borrowed $3,500 for a down payment on the factory, and went into business with his brother, C.W. Cyberling. They decided to take the leap into making rubber products. They named their company after Charles Goodyear, who was the inventor of vulcanization. Unfortunately, Goodyear had died penniless, 40 years earlier. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Factory would eventually become one of the largest companies in the city of Akron. Goodyear, who never came to the area, had a statue put up of him in downtown Akron. And Cyberling's mansion, he called Stan Hewitt Hall, would eventually become one of the largest attractions of the city, boasting some of the finest gardens on display in all of Northeast Ohio. Another Akron rubber manufacturer was Harvey Firestone. Firestone started out his career as a salesman. He worked his route from Detroit to Chicago. He would come to Akron to buy tires, and then he resold them. Firestone was also good friends with Henry Ford. Firestone founded his company in Akron in 1900. Although he was in competition with the two larger companies of Goodrich and Goodyear, Firestone was chosen by his friend Henry Ford to exclusively make the tires for the Ford automobiles. So this was an advantage no one else had at the time. During this time, one of the largest department stores in the city of Akron was the O'Neill Company Department Store. Michael O'Neill was the head of the company. His son William became interested in starting his own tire and rubber company. Michael O'Neill staked his son in his rubber business. William founded the General Tire and Rubber Company. It became one of the top rubber manufacturers of Akron and is now better known as General Tire. By 1910, because of rubber manufacturing and its connection to the automotive industry, Akron became one of the fastest growing cities in the U.S. By 1950, more than 130 different companies manufactured rubber in all of Ohio, but the king of the industry was definitely Akron. It became known as the rubber capital of the U.S., or the rubber city. But, by the late 20th century, and into the 21st century, the rubber industry declined in Akron. Now, the rubber manufacturers of Akron only produce a small percentage of tires and other rubber products in the U.S. Yet the most famous person of Northeast Ohio, and the biggest winner in the automotive industry, happens to be John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller was born in upstate New York. He was part of a large family that moved many times in his lifetime, before they finally settled in Cleveland. At age 16, Rockefeller became a bookkeeper. He also tried several different types of businesses, with various partners, all by age 20. He had an amazing work ethic, and was always a very determined, and very forward-thinking individual. In 1870, he formed the Standard Oil Company. At first he sold oil, mostly for use as a light source for the oil lamps of the day. This was prior to homes being lit by electric light. Then, as many homes started using electricity, and stopped needing to use kerosene as a source of light, 
the automobile industry was just beginning to flourish. Rockefeller took advantage of this, and began refining his oil, so that it could be used as gasoline, to power these new automobiles. He built his refineries on the shore of the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland. Rockefeller was able to gain influence over the fuel and railroad industries, by making secret deals with the railroads to exclusively transport his fuel all over the country. This sufficiently cut out any competition he might have had. He revolutionized the petroleum industry with his methods and tactics, creating a monopoly in the process. Rockefeller became such a powerful force in the industry, that in 1911, the Supreme Court ruled that he was in violation of federal antitrust laws. Standard Oil was then broken up into 34 separate entities, and these companies became Sohio, ExxonMobil, Chevron, among several others. After disputes with the city of Cleveland, Rockefeller was forced to leave the city. He made New York City the new headquarters of Standard Oil. Even though he was shunned by the city, he never lost his influence in Cleveland. It still remains such a vital part of the city in so many ways, and is felt all over. Right after Rockefeller's death, his body was snuck back to Cleveland to be buried in a place of prominence at Lakeview Cemetery. He lies among his fellow industrialists and old friends. The automotive industry is still very dominant in Cleveland and Northeast Ohio. Though it is no longer the hub of automaking that it once was, it continues to play an important role. You can go to Cleveland, Akron, Warren, Youngstown, Elyria, and Lorraine to see how the auto industry still impacts the Northeast Ohio area, and how vital it is to the economy and to the community. It is still one of the most important industries in the region. Thank you for watching the icons of Northeast Ohio. We want to thank all of our subscribers. If you have not subscribed to our channel, please do so and also please make sure to click the notification button so you can be notified when we drop our new videos. Also please visit our Patreon page and become one of our patrons. We have provided a link to our page below. By being one of our patrons, you will help us continue to create more of these videos. As a patron, you will get special perks, including a shout-out on future videos, and access to special videos that are for patrons only. If you have any ideas for any future videos on icons of Northeast Ohio, or icons of other areas of the country, please leave a comment in our comment section. We would love to hear your ideas, and you may even see your idea in a future video. Thanks again for watching the icons of Northeast Ohio. Please look for more videos in the near future.